welcome. I'm Ashley Hansberger. I'm the Executive Director for Poultry Industry Council. And we are live on a Tuesday, bringing you the High Path Even Influenza Situational Update. This series has been supported through the CAP program. So we've been working with OMAFRA to do outreach between now and mid-December to make sure that we're bringing the best information and all the updates that you need to know regarding the avian influenza outbreaks happening in Ontario. And once again, all the links and the recordings will be available on the Biosecurity and Disease page on PIC's website uh, in the next couple of days. And all of the previous recordings are also available through the YouTube channel. So feel free to check them out. And my question again is, have you checked out the emergency planning resource? I'm not going to stop talking about it until we get rid of all the paper copies. So please go on poultryindustrycouncil.ca and check out the online version. And if you're an Ontario producer, feel free to register and we'll mail you a paper copy as well. And tonight's agenda. Uh, so each week we're trying to bring different experts to the forefront and different pieces of information. So once again, we have uh, Vaishnavi from CFIA who's gonna give us a, a quick update, uh, which is nice because there's been not a lot of activity since last week. We're also joined again by Mark Bevins. So last week he gave us a little bit of a teaser for cleaning and disinfecting practices and some science behind it as well. So we can kind of understand what we're doing as we go through those processes. Um, Brian Stevens is here as well as Dr. Lucy for question and answers, but they don't really have a formal update tonight. Um, and then Chris Sharp is going to give us an overview of the bird migration. So that's that's a huge influencer, obviously, in how high path even influenza is moving throughout North America. Um, so why is it busier out west versus here? He can hopefully shed some light on that. And then as always, we do have our live question and answer. So feel free to pop your questions in the Q&A in the bottom and we'll get to them at the end of the presentations. So I'm gonna turn it over to Vaishnavi. Thank you, Ashley. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as Ashley mentioned, uh, there hasn't been much going on um, in our front here, which is always a good news. Um, so I don't have much to update from my end. Before I uh, turn it over to Ashley, though, I do want to go over uh, our online map that I showed last week um, that was updated. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly share the screen here. So. As you can see, uh, last week I updated that we did have an event response plan that kind of changed the primary control zones and it was now divided into like a commercial primary control zone um, and non-commercial primary control zone. So the map was updated online. So if you go to inspection.gc.ca um, under avian influenza, you will be able to check out this map. It just on the right side, you will see different colors uh, coordinated for it. Um, and you will see the differences between commercial and non-commercial primary control zones. Um, both of them are further divided into infected zone, restricted zone, and uh, security zone. So feel free to just play around with it. If you click on it, you will see map disappearing and some uh, parts of it appearing as well. So just, yeah, I uh, wanted to go over this quickly so that you know um, where to go around and play around it and ask, uh, just see how the whole navigation tool kind of works for you. Um, and that's pretty much it. I don't have any updates, so always a good news is um, welcomed here. So I'm happy to turn it over to Ashley again. Thank you. Thank you. You can keep the no news coming in future weeks as well, Vash. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Mark. So Mark is one of our uh, industry partners. Uh, so PIC, we do education throughout the year. That's our, our mandate. That's the reason why we exist as a charity is under the educational mandate. And in our sector, we have a whole host of experts who work for different companies. And basically our education platform relies on this network of, of knowledge keepers in order to share their insights or their, what they've seen in the field with us. And so that's why we've invited Mark on again to kind of go deep dive into that cleaning and disinfecting topic. Um, and so he's going to talk about, you know, various products or various types of chemicals we can use. He's going to talk about the product that his company sells and kind of talk about some pros and cons, um, but really just give us uh, an all around view on, on some of that science and some of those practices. Thank you, Ashley. Um, thank you very much uh, for everybody uh, joining on tonight. Um, we'll try and go through this uh, relatively um, quickly given the uh, time constraints. So 
We talked tonight about um, the C and D or cleaning and uh, disinfection process. <clears throat> uh, typically, when we talk about cleaning and disinfection, we talk about three steps. Um, this is somewhat dependent on which chemistry you use, but uh, traditionally, um, we talk about the dry clean, uh, then the wet clean, and uh, the disinfection step. So dry cleaning basically is the removal of gross organic material. And when I say gross, I don't mean as in ooey or icky. I'm talking about large amounts. Um, so this is your scraping, sweeping, brushing, or blowing. Um, getting rid of, of the vast majority of the organic material in the, uh, in the facility, in the area that you're cleaning and disinfecting. And then after the uh, dry clean, we, <clears throat> the recommendation the, or the protocol that's recommended is proceeding to a wet clean. Um, basically, wet cleaning is the, first of all, it's an application of a surfactant or a degreaser followed by water washing. Again, there's a little bit of difference in depending on the chemistry you're using on this, but uh, that's traditionally how it's looked at. Um, so this is your soap. This is your, um, um, your different uh, uh, cleaners that are out there um, that you uh, are using to um, uh, rid the surfaces of any organic material that is left um, from, the, uh, from the dry clean that did not, you know, re wasn't removed. Um, this can be done uh, the washing part after you've applied the, uh, the surfactant or soap. Um, can be done either with low pressure or high pressure. When I talk about low pressure, I'm talking about garden hose, uh, normal city water. Uh, high pressure, of course, is with uh, pressure washers. Uh, foaming is recommended. Anytime you apply um, a surfactant or a disinfectant, um, there's many ways you can apply it. You can apply it just as a spray on. Um, or uh, fogging is, a, is another uh, uh, technique that's used, you know, um, um, in agriculture. Um, but for the, for if you really want to get the best recommendation, it, it's, uh, we as biosecurity experts, we recommend foaming. Um, I'll get into the reason why on that in a second. Um, warm or hot water typically increases efficiencies of, um, of uh, the chemicals of the, the, uh, the degreaser, the surfactant, um, as well as um, it, it, it allows that emulsification of, of the, the organic material there to happen easier. So for example, here's a couple pictures to kind of show you from a, a dry cleaned, uh, um, uh, you know, barn there, that door has, has, you know, still has biofilm or organic material on it. And then that's been, uh, it has been uh, wet cleaned up. The prime example again, water lines in a barn. You can see there's still dander there that didn't get blown off. Um, and um, then after your wet clean, you have, you know, you, there's the removal of all the organic material. So then we come to the disinfection step. Um, after removal of all visible organic material and, and there's no standing water left, disinfection can take place. Um, the reason that we, we don't want really any large amounts of standing water um, there is because that can actually affect the dilution of the disinfectant. Um, so if there's, again, if there's, if there's puddles or pools of water, um, and then I apply a disinfectant, which is at the correct dilution, um, that standing water is going to further dilute that uh, disinfectant to, um, you know, which would reduce its efficacy. Um, components of disinfection um, and the specific disinfectant you use um, include contact time, dilution, the coverage rates. Uh, we're also going to talk about log reduction, which is basically sanitizing versus disinfection. Uh, you're going to hear those terms. Um, you may hear those when you're uh, um, dealing in this uh, cleaning and disinfection realm. Um, bactericides, viricides, and fungicide, the, uh, those kind of claims. We're also going to talk here shortly in, about the human and animal health aspects of, of the different, different uh, chemistries out there, as well as the environmental sustainability and the material compatibility. Is, the, is that chemical um, safe to use on the surface that you're, uh, the material that you're using it on? So when we talk about contact time, contact time is the time that the surface needs to stay wet for that disinfectant to truly be effective. Um, so this typically ranges anywhere from three minutes to 20 minutes, depending on the chemistry. Um, if you read the fine print on Lysol wipes, for example, um, it's a 10 minute contact time. 
So in order for that, uh, that Lysol wipe, that disinfectant to truly be effective, that surface needs to stay wet for that 10 minutes. Um, during the COVID uh, experience, I mean, it, it, it made me question um, a lot when I'd go to the grocery store and the cashier was spraying the conveyor with a, you know, with a quat or a disinfectant and uh, wiping it immediately. And, and the surface was wet maybe for seven seconds. Um, really, we're not uh, achieving very much um, through that process. Um, as I said earlier, foaming, uh, foaming increases the surface adhesion and increases the contact time of the disinfectant. Um, how that happens is those, um, those air bubbles that are created in the foam, they actually act as an insulator. And um, so that allows, um, you know, the, the, that disinfectant to stay in a liquid state longer than if it was actually just sprayed on. Um, in addition, foaming, um, you actually can see what's covered, that white uh, foam sticks out um, on the surface that you really can uh, tell what you've covered and what you haven't. And uh, foaming also gives you actually a greater, greater coverage area. The, the, the uh, amount of solution goes further um, because you're actually, you're, you're, you're spreading it thinner um, on, the, uh, on the surface. Dilution, um, you have to be cognizant of uh, ready to use disinfectants versus concentrates. So um, the typical disinfectant you buy in, in the uh, uh, hardware stores or grocery stores, um, whether it be in a, in a spray bottle or in a uh, wipe form, those are ready to use. Um, there's no dilution needed. Um, where concentrates, and this is what we see mostly in agriculture, um, they're, a, they're a concentrated form of that disinfectant. They need to be diluted with water. Um, the, uh, how much water is added to the disinfectant concentration to um, make that in-use solution is the dilution rate. And typically it ranges anywhere from 0.4% to 10% as high as in some cases. So that works out to a ratio of 1 to 256 to 1 to 10. Um, also be noted, um, some chemistries have different dilutions dependent on the pathogen. Some pathogens are harder to kill than others. And so um, you'll, you'll notice that uh, contact time or um, uh, dilutions are, are, could be different. This is primarily in the states that they allow this. In Health Canada, you're really only allowed one dilution rate, but the contact times will, uh, will actually change. Coverage rates. How much solution is required to cover the surface? Um, Traditionally, most disinfectants cover approximately 100, and I forgot to put in here how much, but 125 square feet per gallon of diluted solution. I apologize for the imperial measurements. That's just, um, you know, these are the ones that uh, um, we kind of work with. But um, so one gallon of diluted solution that you've made up, um, spraying that on, or uh, um, if it doesn't foam very well, um, it's going to cover that 100, 125 square feet. Chemistries that foam well will cover more, as I said. Um, you can get up to 250 or 300 square feet per gallon of diluted solution. Log reduction. You'll hear this term sometimes in, uh, in the science of disinfection. Um, three log versus six log reduction. So um, just to be, uh, um, again, note, um, in order to really to be classified as a true disinfectant, you need a, it's a six log reduction. And that translates to six nines is the easiest way to remember it. So a 99.9999% kill. Um, where three log is, is again, 99.9. .9. This is also the, the general accepted classification between sanitizing versus disinfection. So uh, um, sanitizers, when you hear the term sanitize, it's generally speaking um, to a, a three log reduction and a uh, where disinfection is talking about a six log reduction. Um, <clears throat> you know, you'd think, well, is that really a big difference? Well, it, it, it can be when you're talking, uh, um, especially with viruses, um, it's, um, um, you know, very little virus is needed um, to uh, cause uh, um, an infection. So, when, when uh, it's very important that you're getting that, you know, that true kill rate that you're actually trying to achieve. And just a, of note, when um, 
when uh, a disinfectant gets its claim, it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's license to kill, if you want to call it, um, approval from uh, Health Canada or in the States, the EPA, all that testing that has uh, shown the science of that disinfectant that it can kill is done at 20 degrees Celsius um, with no organic load. And um, every the, as temperature drops, contact time increases um, to obtain the equivalent log reduction. So for example, if a, if a, uh, a disinfectant has a 10 minute contact time um, at 20 degrees, typically it would be double that or 20 minutes at you know, zero degrees. Um, and, and, and again, further increases of contact time even under uh, below zero. So again, you wanna make sure that uh, you're getting, doing the best job you can to achieve the longest contact time possible. Bactericide, viricide, and fungicide claims. So dis disinfectants are tested against a range of specific pathogens. And, and these are listed either on the label, on the reference sheet of a, a disinfectant. Now we're most of course concerned with avian influenza here tonight. Um, thankfully, um, uh, avian influenza is, is not a difficult um, uh, pathogen to kill. Um, um, we we, we, we kind of listed or regarded it as a wimpy virus. Um, so thankfully, it's, it's not that difficult to kill, again, if there's no presence of organic material. Um, <clears throat> some pathogens are actually recognized as hard to kill, i.e. Uh, polio 7 type number one. Um, it's generally accepted as one of the world's hardest viruses to kill. So disinfectants are allowed what they call a general virucidal claim or a bactericidal claim, um, fungicidal claim, where they've shown to kill the really, really tough ones. And therefore it's accepted that they don't need to, um, um, you know, test against, you know, hundreds or thousands of other disinfect, uh, other uh, different pathogens. They have that general virucidal, fungicidal or bactericidal claim. Human health uh, issues. Um, traditional chemistries can have um, significant health warnings. Um, so make sure you read the MSDS sheet and follow the, the uh, label. Um, you know, really encourage you to read the fine print on, uh, on whatever chemistry you're using. Um, they'll require, you know, PPE from gloves and goggles to masks and even respirators. Um, some of the uh, chemistries out there are, um, are, are very nasty. And um, um, so just be, you know, be wary of that. <clears throat> Environmental and, and material compatibility. Um, disinfectants can be harmful to the environment. Um, so again, make sure uh, you're aware of, uh, you know, in terms of disposal, um, you know, overspray, you know, the, uh, uh, that kind of thing. Um, disinfectants can also harm or damage certain materials, um, whether it be concrete. There are certain disinfectants that basically they eat concrete alive over time. Um, some of the, um, <clears throat> you know, the metals, um, there's issues there. So again, follow the label instructions when it comes to material compatibility and disposal. If you are concerned about a certain uh, um, um, you know, surface material um, and the uh, disinfectant uh, um, you know, uh, uh, damaging it, um, you can always you know, get that contact time and then you can rinse, um, uh, rinse it off if uh, you really feel necessary. But as I said, the, the best thing that you can do is try and leave it on there as long as possible. So just spend a few slides here on, on disinfectant comparisons. Um, I've just picked uh, the, the major ones here, but there's, there's quaternary ammonias or quats they're known as. Typically they have about a 10 minute contact time. Um, very narrow effectiveness. They're, they're effective against the easiest of pathogens um, and they have a very limited cleaning ability. There's, there's really no surfactants in there. So that surface must be absolutely spotless um, before uh, you wanna use a quat. Um, there are some human health risk and environmental concerns. Um, the one uh, plus about quats is they're very inexpensive. They're very, you know, very uh, uh, cheap to use. Uh, glutaraldehydes, um, glutes we call them. Uh, again, typically a 10 minute contact time. They do have a broad spectrum kill. Um, and, um, but the thing is with them, they have zero, I mean, just like no cleaning ability whatsoever. Um, so again, surface must be absolutely uh, spotless, you know, even more so than the quad. Um, glutes are also, um, there's some significant uh, health concerns and, um, and cautions and, and environmental cautions as well. Uh, Cost-wise, they're about an average cost. Um, 
there's some there's some uh, chemicals out there, chemistries um, that maybe use a combination of of uh, glute with a quat, or uh, for example, I believe synergize is uh, is that way. So they're trying to um, get uh, um, you know the, kind of combine the two. Um, unfortunately, you know they they still maintain some of those negative uh, connotations even um, um, with that. Uh, chlorine uh, bleach, we uh, we you know we're pretty much uh, all aware of that again. It's about a ten minute contact time, very broad spectrum kill, um, no cleaning ability whatsoever. Again, that surface must be absolutely spotless. Um, there are some human health risks and environmental concerns, but again, very inexpensive. Um, oxidizers, this would be um, something like a Vercon, uh, for example. Um, a uh, ten to twenty minute contact time, depending on the pathogen. Um, that's neat. That's uh, you're trying to go after, um, but again, a very broad. It kills a it kills a broad spectrum of uh, organisms. Um, some cleaning ability actually. Um, um, there's actually a, a, a uh, um, cleaning ability test, and, and relative to the traditional older style disinfectants, um, Burkon is actually not that bad when it comes to cleaning ability. So it has a bit of a um, uh, an ability to clean even with the presence of limited organic material. Um, unfortunately, there are some concerns health-wise and environmental-wise um, and material compatibility-wise. Um, somewhat costly. Um, the one that um, actually referred to that we deal with is accelerated hydrogen peroxide. Um, it's a relatively newer um, uh, development in disinfection. It's actually a Canadian invention, actually. And um, it's a very fast uh, contact time. It's, it's only a five minute contact time using the concentrate, uh, three minutes with the uh, ready to use. Very broad spectrum kill, excellent cleaning ability. It really does um, more, way more so than uh, Vercon even. It has a, has, has a, the surfactants in there make it a, a real um, great cleaner as well as a disinfectant. And um, uh, Iowa State University actually has some research on this where they were able to kill um, uh, porcine endemic diarrhea or PED in a uh, heavy uh, fecal load, actually, um, something that no other real disinfectant can even think about doing. Um, because of those surfactants, it does have a great coverage area. Um, the dilution is 1 to 40 for disinfection and 1 to 128 for sanitizing and cleaning. So you have a, a range of um, uh, dilutions to make it uh, cost effective. Um, no PP required and environmentally safe. It's actually the first disinfectant to have eco logo approval, um, biodegradable. And um, as I said, it's, um, it gives you an average cost comparison. Um, those pictures I showed you before, um, I actually cheated. Those were actually done with uh, accelerated hydrogen peroxide or the brand name here in, in Canada for agriculture is called Prevail. And um, that was actually just with uh, uh, low pressure water. So that was that that overhead door was formed on uh, with uh, Prevail, and then just not pressure washed, just uh, rinsed off with a uh, um, uh, a garden hose. And that's actually, believe it or not, that's 11 years of biofilm on that door. That was a an egg layer barn that um, hadn't been washed very much. Um, same thing here. This was um, Prevail at just as a rinsed off. Um, so anyway, a summary, um, three-step process, as I said, typically, you can get one-step uh, cleaners and disinfectants like, uh, like the accelerated hydrogen peroxide um, that can shorten that. Um, but typically the surfaces must be clean of organic material prior to disinfection. Most importantly, read and follow the label instructions, including that fine print. Um, it's you know, it's gonna tell you that contact time. It's gonna tell you the proper dilution. And then lastly, check those MSDS sheets for precautions, i.e., do you need PPE? Does it need to be well ventilated? Uh, do you need a respirator? Um, is there any uh, uh, special concerns in terms of handling that product? That's about it I have. Um, I see we've got some questions. I can answer them later or probably later, Ashley, that's what you want. That's kind of how we do it around here. Yep. All righty. Make people stew in their questions. But that's that's a super great overview. And I definitely appreciate all of that information you pulled together. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get going on the questions right after we hear from Christopher Sharp. Hi, thanks, everyone. So my name's Chris Sharp, and I'm a uh, population management biologist for Environment and Climate Change Canada. 
here tonight to talk to you about avian influenza in wild birds. So just a little bit of a chronological order of the spread of high path AI in North American birds. So we had our first uh, detections last December, seems like ages ago, when CFIA confirmed a die off of, of birds at a multi-species farm in Newfoundland. In very short order, we had detections of high path AI all along the Atlantic coast from Newfoundland to Florida. So that that's that's that was a really uh, unfortunate result because the th tricky thing with the Atlantic coast and the Atlantic flyway is that in one uh, migration season, so in the spring, just the spring migration, we knew that the uh, virus was going to move across all four flyways, and and sure enough, it did. So by the summer we had rapid spread and high local prevalence across all four flyways so it went from florida all the way to alaska and 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 um with some detections across the canadian arctic we saw observed mortality in more than 50 species of birds uh waterfowl seabirds and as well as scavenger species best estimates are about 45,000 or more individuals um, succumb to the to the virus of wild birds. We've also had detections in mammalian species. Um, these species are thought to be uh, pre predators or um, scavengers of sick or dead uh, birds. So, so that's that's like the likely means of transmission there. So we had this resurgence since the fall of infection in waterfowl as migratory birds leave the breeding areas. Commonly in the north, they congregate at fall stop over sites, um, typically in agricultural areas, and then subsequently move on to wintering areas. So the impact to poultry of this of this virus, uh, just in the last sort of ten months, is over three hundred or three million birds impacted at one hundred and ninety infected premises nationally. So that's a very different um, experience than previous uh, avian influenza outbreaks that we've seen in Canada. And, and we, we think the reason is um, it's a change in the, the prevalence of the high path AI in wild birds. So here's a schematic of what previous outbreaks looked like. So we have here um, wild birds, commonly uh, waterfowl, shorebirds, colonial seabirds that, that are natural reservoirs for low path avian influenza. These birds forage and, um, and transmit the, the virus through a fecal oral pathway. And because they're migratory in nature, they're, they disperse the, the virus on the landscape. Typically in previous outbreaks, low path AI would move from wild birds into the agricultural setting where we would see adaptation in, in an evolution in the, in the agricultural setting. And then high path AVI viruses would either move into humans, which is always a risk or back into wildlife. And then we would start to see some die offs um, in wild birds. Unfortunately, in this current outbreak, we now have high path AI circulating broadly in the wild bird population. So now we no longer need this intermediate um, agricultural setting to facilitate the, 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 um, the evolution of low path to high path. So now it's very easy for high path AI to get into commercial poultry. So that we think that that's kind of the main reason why we're seeing such a such a difference in in um, relative risk this time. So now I'll talk about migration. So so here's here's a graph that shows these lines show uh, an indices of migration and or or uh, local abundance relative abundance over time of common species commonly thought to play a role in uh, high path AI transmission. So we have mallards, 
Canada geese, green-winged teal, and ring-billed gulls. And so as you can see, um, as the birds move, moved into southern Ontario, we see an uptick in their detections. And that uptick follows pretty closely with when we see uh, infected premises start to show up. Then as their detections are lower through the summer months, we, we, we had a lull in um, infected premises. And then things started to tick back up in the fall. And this is only current to a couple, to a week or so ago. Um, so there's definitely a, um, a link between uh, migration of, of wild birds and risk of high path AI infection. So the next couple of slides, I'll explain this one, but um, the next couple of slides are showing movement, the migration, a video or an animation of uh, migration uh, for, for three of those species, the mallard, Canada geese and ring-billed gulls. So as you see the, the animation move forward and I'll press play in a second, uh, yellow low is relatively low abundance, whereas purple is higher abundance. Here we have the week of the year. So you'll see this black move across um, as we move from January, February, right through to December. So this will show an entire annual cycle. One thing to note is in Southwestern Ontario, as well as Eastern Ontario, where the, a disproportionate amount of the poultry farms are, you'll see that the relative abundance is high in those areas. So here's mallards. You see this is over winter. Now we're moving into spring migration. Southern Ontario starts to get purple for a very short time. And now they disperse onto the breeding grounds. It's a summertime lull. And then they start to come back in during uh, fall migration. And Southern Ontario gets purple, purple again. The next one for Canada geese. This is a little more dramatic just because the overall numbers of Canada geese in Ontario. But again, Ontario, Southern Ontario remains purple throughout the winter. And then as my great spring migration goes, the birds move. Many of the birds are moving north, although we do have some Canada geese nesting in Southern Ontario. And then with fall migration, it, it comes back in a pretty dramatic wave of purple um, that stays quite purple um throughout the late into december and into the winter and again you can see this is january southwestern ontario still has high relative abundance and eastern ontario had relatively high abundance through to december and then here's ring-billed gulls which um people maybe don't think as much about but are are fairly common around farms so this is a little bit different distribution um, as the birds migrate, they move on to, they migrate through Southern Ontario, then they move to breeding areas, commonly around the large lakes. They breed in the summer and then they move back. And interesting, uh, uh, producers all see the, the ring-billed gulls foraging in farm fields after the, after the fields are plowed. And you can see um, in, in, in the fall, there's quite a few relative abundance of ring-billed gulls is actually quite high inland, probably taking advantage of that agricultural subsidy. So what does this all mean for uh, uh, poultry owners? Well, wild birds are really good at moving avian influenza over long distances, but wild birds should not be interacting with poultry. So it's the, it's the owner's responsibility to prevent the movement of the virus from wild birds to their, their flocks. So that's kind of lesson number one. While Ontario saw a lull in infections in, in, during the summer, our migrations are now going uh, full swing. So now is the time to really be vigilant to protect your flock. Also, unfortunately for folks in, in Southern Ontario, um, migratory birds over winter here. So that risk will remain throughout the winter and until next spring. Um, additionally, the large, large overwintering congregations of waterfowl combined with cold temperatures help to facilitate 
transmission of avian influenza. So if, if it's highly probable that things are gonna get worse in Southern Ontario before they get better. One easy way to help mitigate your risk is please avoid attracting wild birds to your property. That, that can be done fairly easily. Don't put up bird feeders, try to have exclosures over, over top of your, your uh, backyard flock or commercial flock. And, and clean up any grain that, or feed that might be uh, messy around the property. There's a number of resources here um, to provide information to various stakeholders. And, and these are the best resources because these are updated uh, automatically as new, as new information is developed. Um, I will, um, Ashley asked about why we're seeing things differently in the prairies compared to Ontario. So this is this is where I, I, I was able to get those animations. This is a publicly accessible website called eBird. And all this data that is here that, that was used to make these animations are is citizen science. So people, bird watchers, naturalists go out, observe birds, report them to eBird, and then people smarter than myself are able to make uh, these these animations. Um, so this is the same map, just on a more national scale. And if you watch the the prairie pothole region of of the prairies here, watch how purple that stays throughout the summer. Much more purple than what we see in Ontario. So very few birds in the winter, but then as migration happens, they move into the breeding areas, and see how that prairie pothole region, which is the, also known as the duck factory of North America, stays quite purple all, all, through, all through the summer. So I suspect that that's why we, we saw um, IPs in, in Prairie Canada th throughout the summer and, and earlier into the fall, or started earlier in the fall than we saw in Ontario, just because there's, relatively there's more birds um, out there for longer. They will. They should get some relief with the as the winter months come. Uh, but but they probably won't don't get the lull that we saw that we were fortunate enough to see in the summer. And with that, that's that's all I have uh, for this evening. Thanks, Chris. That's an excellent overview, and I'm definitely going to check out. I have the Merlin Bird app on my phone because I'm always trying to ID who's singing in my backyard, but. Those videos give like a super great uh, overview of um, migratory patterns and who's hanging around. Yeah, they're they're re a really good visual for for people. Yeah. So I think that is the end of our formal presentations. But if we could just get our uh, our question our question answerers on uh, screen here, uh, Mark, and we've got Lucy. Anyone else? Um, we can start knocking off some of these questions. So we have a question for Vaish about any um, any of the primary control zones. Have they been revoked recently? Is there any change on that front uh, this week versus last week? Yeah, um, so the recent change uh, that happened actually last week, uh, which was around Wednesday, uh, was just IP32 with primary control zone 116. Um, that was revoked, and that was because of reclassification uh, from commercial poultry to non-commercial, non-poultry side of things uh, with the new event response plan on the change of some definitions um, around that. Um, so that was revoked. It's online. It's been updated on the map too. Other than that, we didn't have anything else revoked recently. Um, tying up to that, like uh, Gary has another question on how long does it take? Um, it depends. Um, so in order to have a PCZ revoked, um, they have to go through a primary decontamination. Uh, that happens after the destruction and disposal in the infected premise. Um, the primary decontamination is basically the uh, cleaning and disinfection of dry materials, infected materials at the premise. As soon as that's signed off by CFIA, um, it goes into post outbreak surveillance, which takes um, around 28 days. Um, and during that post outbreak surveillance, we go through like dead bird surveillance, sick bird calls, and like full out health questionnaires. Uh, so some documentations and testings uh, needs to be submitted to CFIA. 
if everything goes well within that 28 day period, then we revoke the primary control zone after that. Okay. And Vash, can you remind me, there was a slide deck that kind of showed a timeline that's available on CFI. Yes. Um, right? yes. So if yes. you, um, yeah, if you go online, I'm just going to share the screen. So you seem to recall it has a significant amount of detail as far as like why it takes certain amount of times and why there, there's that period where it, you know, it could take longer or shorter, depending. So um, if you go to the inspection.gc.ca under avian influenza, uh, there's a path to revoking on uh, the primary control zone. So it does talk about the detail um, on individual IPs, uh, infected zone and primary control zone. Um, when I open it up, it basically brings down to the actual mapping. I'm not sure if you can see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it just talks about the revocation. And if you look at the PCZ, um, that's where the primary decontamination of the infected premise takes place. Once that's done, you go under the 28-day out post-outbreak surveillance. If no positive detection has been observed, um, PCZ will be revoked by CFIA. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so we have a question about a story that we heard out of Southern Florida about um, a woman who's kind of TikTok famous, social media famous, and she has a whole bunch of birds that were unfortunately hit by avian influenza. And it sounds like about 50 or so birds died. So is, is anyone in tune with this group or any uh, information there? I think I can give you some general information about it. Uh, last avian influenza reported in Florida was October 20th in two small flocks. They were about 60 and two respectively birds. And October 18th, another three small flocks affecting about 326 birds. And currently they have been like zero commercial flocks affected, uh, 10 backyard flocks and a total of like over uh, 1,100 birds affected in this outbreak. Um, I have seen that um, uh, TikTok um, picture because I think everybody is talking about it and that was posted on uh, October 17. So I do assume that um, if it would to be uh, declared as an outbreak, it was somewhere October 20th, October 18th. However, on a website, if you um, go and look on the United States website, they do not post the name of the farm where um, the birds were affected. Um, I will stress enough and about the human component here and the zoonotic potential that even influenza can be transmitted to humans. So I'll be very cautious about that, but I do not have any updates about how that UMU is doing and what is doing. But normally if they institute a quarantine, they will normally destroy the birds. So um, I don't have any updates in that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hit mainstream media and one would assume that the research that goes into the reporting and stuff is is verified factually. So yeah. there should be no reason to not believe those. But at least they were like five um, outbreaks in that period of time. So it could mm -hmm. be possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super sad to kind of follow those stories, definitely. Yes, indeed. Okay, so we've got a question. Follow up from Mark. Uh, it's good that AI is easy to kill. Um, but it lives long outside in the normal environment. So how long does it live and where are the yeah. speedy places? So, that yeah, happen? great question. It's all very dependent on temperature, but um, unfortunately it can live for months actually outside. Um, it's, uh, especially in the cooler temperatures. Um, I think actually there's some, I've seen some data like six or nine months at four degrees. And, and uh, so, yeah. So, and I just want to also clear, but when I say it's a wimpy virus, it's easy to kill. It, that given, you know, in terms of comparative to other viruses. So I don't want to give the the, uh, the impression that, oh, we don't have to worry about it because it's easily killed. Um, it's easily killed with disinfectants um, given the proper circumstances. And so um, I think the lesson there is, is that, um, you know, proper cleaning and disinfection will go a long way to uh, protecting yourself um, from uh, getting avian influenza. And, and then one more thing to add is with the structure of the virus, and then that's why it is very easy to kill it because it has an envelope. Yeah. 
Yes. And then that one gets destroyed very well, dissolved by the disinfectants, dissolved by the soap too. So it's very important. Now, in terms of like, um, as it's been stated before, temperature is a significant factor as the virus persists for longer time at four degrees and more than 20 degrees Celsius. And Pennsylvania University, they did a study and they investigated the survival of the virus in feather, muscle, or liver tissues, collecting from some chickens that they were experimentally infected with um, H5N1 in tissues stored uh, four degrees and 20 degrees Celsius. And um, they were isolating the virus um, um, on a different times so over 360 days. And the maximum period for survival of the virus were observed in samples stored at four degrees Celsius in all tissues types. And they were like 240 days in feathers, mm. 160 days in muscle and about 20 days in liver. And um, um, the viral infectivity at uh, 20 degrees Celsius was maintained for a maximum of 30 days in the feather tissues and 20 days in muscle. Mm -hmm. um, as far for the environment is up to eight weeks at four degrees Celsius in both, uh, both uh, wet and dry feces. And um, the virus can be detected at four degrees Celsius after 35 days. Uh, mm -hmm. Remember the first case that we've had it, it was in Newfoundland where temperature in December was, I don't know, under minus 20 or so. So yeah, cool. Yes, yes. <laughs> it is a protein. So when you're talking about protein, where do you keep the meat? In a freezer and you keep it like for six months. Yes. So it will survive better in the colder temperature for sure. That's a great analogy. Um, so this is a question for Vash. Wondering on the map that you showed why there's nothing showing up for the Owen Sound area following the culling of the birds at the Harrison Park in mid-September. And do you have any information on the swans that were able to be quarantined? Um, so IP28, which is on uh, the Owen Sound uh, infected premise, won't show up on the map just because it's non-poultry, uh, non-commercial. So if there's non-poultry, we don't have a primary control zone. Uh, and the map specifically is just for primary control zones, hence you won't be able to see it online. Um, in regards to the swans, um, they were uh, released from quarantine a couple of weeks ago, um, and they were moved to an outdoor um, area in a different park away from the actual premise. Um, at the moment, we just know that it's been healthy, but we are not actually uh, continuously looking into how the swans are, but they are healthy um, the last time we checked. Thank you. So a question about Prevail, is that product generally available anywhere or is it? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and it's, it's available in agricultural supply stores right across um, Canada actually, but uh, here in Ontario, there's various ones. Um, you can uh, either go to our website or check check your your um, your most of your um, agricultural stores. Um, and um, yeah, it's available for small flock owners. Um, it comes in you know in various uh, size formats. And uh, we've actually been helping uh, a number of small flock owners over the last couple of weeks because of AI for that okay. matter. Um, I had a question about expiry dates on various products. Do you have any comments about like, oh, but I've got this jug of whatever from last right. year. Right, that's right. We, we, we talked about that earlier today, didn't we? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good? so um, Health Canada, so on your disinfectant, um, there's different expiry dates. Um, um, depending on the disinfectant, the longest expiry or shelf life uh, you can get for a, uh, a disinfectant is two years in Canada. Um, um, I don't know the expiry dates of some of the chemistries, but in terms of prevail, it, it, the concentrate, it is a two year expiry. Um, once you mix up the solution, um, it is uh, good for 30 days, which is again, the longest in, um, uh, this, um, shelf life for an in use solution, uh, from a concentrate. Um, that being said, um, if you have old disinfectant, um, um, you know, again, I can't really speak to any others, but in terms of prevail, um, you, if, if it's out of date, um, you know, shortly, um, just increase the concentration maybe. Um, but typically it's, you know, you use it on enough basis that you're never going to get to that two year uh, life cycle. Okay. That's good to know. Got some really old skanky hand sanitizer from 2020 that I should probably get rid of. So, <laughs> um, what kind of equipment if you're going to do the phone right. 
practice what so, kind of equipment would you need i get to do show and tell now um so yeah so because of foaming we we always recommend foaming no matter what and, and you can have foaming in terms of like a you know little pump up jugs like that or um you know garden sprayer kind of uh outfits um and again you you know for you you can use just a regular garden sprayer. It will not foam, um, but um, um, you know you can use that. But if you actually want it to foam and follow the recommendation, you can buy a pump up garden sprayer that is actually a foamer as well. They're out there on the market. We we do sell them. Uh, low pressure. Um, that's just hooked up to a garden hose. The uh, the concentrate you know kind of sits in here. This is some people refer to this as a foam cannon. Um, car de car detailers use these a lot. Uh, oh. um, you know, that kind of thing. And then uh, we also have the high pressure stuff. It's all kind of like uh, stainless steel, um, the injector where it sits right after the, uh, the pressure washer and then the foaming nozzle that goes onto the gun. And um, it's it's a real simple process that acts as a, what they call a Venturi tube um, that sucks air in and uh, it agitates it through a screen and it mixes it with the chemical and it comes out like uh, wet shaving cream. So yeah, so all those uh, different equipment um, they're not uh, large expenses. I mean, I think these are like 20 bucks to uh, to uh, the pump up foamer uh, portable ones like the garden spare size 12 liters are like 150. Um, these like 150 or so um, the high pressure stuff. It's all stainless steel. It's a little bit more expensive. Okay. That's great. Well, it's good to get the good quality stuff so you don't have corrosion issues and stuff like that. I would assume that's correct. Uh, so we have a question about the status of noted or documented deaths of pigeons. Brian, I'm not sure if you want to take that. Yeah, I could take it. So we haven't had any documented cases in wild pigeons in Ontario, um, but we do know that they can be infected. There have been cases in Europe. Um, and I believe in the spring there was a, a case of domestic pigeons that were testing positive in Ontario as well. So we do know that they can be infected with the virus okay. um, and potentially spread it around. Um, so it is not common in the wild, it appears, in this group, um, but they are a species that definitely can be infected. Okay. And actually, this uh, pigeon came from an infected premise, and it was um, a swab oropharyngeal, and then it was positive. Um, that was uh, dated back in May, May 23rd. I do have the uh, laboratory results, so, mm. but I cannot share with you guys because it's confidential. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we have a bit of a scenario question here. So someone has a log barn with masonry, half walls and a cement floor and no water to the barn. To clean, sanitize and disinfect, can using buckets and scrub brushes be effective? Yep, certainly. I mean, again, if you're uh, um, to, if you have no real water available, um, you'd want to, um, again, do a very good dry clean and then carry water through buckets, that sort of thing and squeegee, you know, wash and soap and then squeegee, uh, you know, squeegee much as that out and, um, and then use a, a disinfectant. And again, if you're having to use it with mop and bucket or brushes, um, by all means, it's, it's not the most effective, but it's better than nothing. That's for sure. Um, and, um, in terms of the log side of things, the wood. Um, you know, you need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, uh, wood is, is porous. It's not a solid, you know, it's not a, a stainless steel, for example. And so, um, you know, you might want to be very liberal in terms of your application of um, any disinfectant on the wood to make sure that you get uh, a great uh, surface coverage and as much in there as possible. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is a question for Chris. So we're looking at the weekly relative abundance mapping. Do you have any predictions for next year? Yeah, so so those um, those maps are are based on eBird data from twenty or two thousand six to twenty twenty, and they are generalized estimates for twenty twenty. So that's a in the past. They're not a prediction for this next year. They're just a generality of of the average movements of birds on the landscape. So in a year where things stay warm for longer, you, you might anticipate a um, delay in fall migration, for example, or if things get cooler sooner, you, you, you would anticipate earlier migration uh, as things further north get cold. So 
I, I think it's just to assume an average and it's more of a visualization of migration and relative abundance on the kind of Ontario or Canadian landscape. Okay. So migration follows the predictions of weather, which is pretty tricky. Yeah. yeah. There'll be annual variation in, in the timing, but but more or less it's sort of the same thing within a couple of weeks. Um, so this is a question to clarify, the cold weather doesn't kill or deter AI. So we're kind of looking ahead to winter. Does that change things? Are we in the clear? No. No, it's not. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. And I, I appreciate, Lucy, your refrigerator comment because I yes. had not thought of it that way. And yeah. It's easy to analogy, yes. Yeah. When, when I ship Brian a swab or a carcass that's infected, it's frozen and it's the it's it's really good. So okay. that that's that's what we're having. The the environment's about to come a, become a deep freezer as we go into winter. Okay. Um. So I think we might have covered this, but Lucy, can you just reiterate how long the virus survives in feces left in the field by geese and gulls? And uh, it's not... about yeah, it's about eight weeks at four degrees Celsius. Okay. And yes. then how does this affect birds such as mourning doves? Is there any restrictions on birds that can or cannot get infected or affected? No, all birds. Yeah, and just assume that any bird could be infected by this. Right, and mammals. Um, so we have a question about where in Southern Ontario the pigeons are infected, but I'm not sure just because of confidentiality if we can. I'm gonna say north of Toronto, GTA. Okay. North of, okay. I have no idea. So uh, just to follow up on Owen Sound, if non-commercial is the is only poultry and also not wild birds, is there anywhere you can see these outbreaks? So how, how can people track things that are not commercial or non-commercial poultry? Um, so in that case, uh, we won't have a map to track things, but if we go to the inspection.gc.c, I'm just gonna share that screen again. So we go there. Um, so if we go back to the main page, um, you can go for status of ongoing response, um, scroll down, and then you would be able to select Ontario. And just based on the premise, you will be able to see non-commercial, non-poultry too. It will just, it won't have a PCZ. So we won't say like provoked, uh, stuff like that, but it would just be, um, an infected premise release instead. Um, and that goes through like our just calls uh, online. We do like a feather board um, command center call on, on a noon basis, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, where I basically provide updates on all of these things. So that would be infected zone release, uh, PCZ revocation and stuff like that. So that's one way to um, get uh, the information. The other is just the advisories through FBCC and OMAFRA. And so just to clarify, Bash, the examples of these non-poultry, non-commercial, they're like outdoor zoo type places. Like what other types of places would those be? It can all it can also be like a backhead flock, right? Kind of thing. But where like so our uh, poultry definition is like about 300. There has to be some kind of commercial like sale activities taking place or like involvement with commercial premises and stuff. So there's like a whole bunch of questions that the planning committee has to ask uh, the producers before they can make the actual determination of like non-poultry and stuff. For example, with IP32, um, we decided it would be poultry because the event response plan for it change the definition was 300 plus and they had pigeons that crossed that mark of 300 plus birds in that area even though there was no uh, sale activity taking place but after the new york national kind of made those changes we were like okay the definition changed now so we can classify it as non-poultry even though they're just because we are not considering pigeons anymore if they are not actually used for sale purposes okay yeah you got some comments chris yeah no i i uh posted into the, 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 in the Q&A section a link to the uh, HPAI dashboard that CWHC and, and CFIA host. And, and um, I can, I don't know, Brian, if you, if you want to do the plug for it or I can, I can share my screen. I have it up if you want. Yeah, go for it. I don't have it up, so. Okay. Um, Just shared it in the chat as well. Yeah. So 
Um, this is a dashboard. It's oh, is my oh, my. I'm having a hard time sharing my screen today. There you so go. This is this is the CFIA and and. Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative dashboard that's publicly available. And, and you can zoom in, um, you can see it has wild bird detections. It has both poultry and non-poultry, I believe. Um, and so this is, it's, it's not up to date perfectly, but I, I think it's probably the best public facing interface for to keep up to date um, on, on things in your area. I don't know, uh, Ryan, if you have anything to add. No, I mean, it's it's a good dashboard to kind of get an idea as to where things are. Um, and yeah, you can pull off some of those uh, markers as you go. I think the orange and red are wild, and then the stars are the poultry and non-poultry. Yeah, that's great. So those are two really good resources for tracking those non-commercial off, off the map kind of. Yeah situation. Uh, so while we have the wild bird conversation going on, um, someone's concerned about neighbors feeding the wild birds in the winter uh, with the odd wild turkey visiting, wants to know if it's okay to feed, you know, mostly chickadees, blue jays, and other small birds. Yeah, so I mean, we, we don't really want uh, poultry owners feeding wild birds, attracting them to their, to their property. But, uh, but I think if, if, neighbors are attracting and it's not huge numbers i mean we're we're we don't typically think of those songbirds as, as being a, a a main vector for movement of the disease although they they can um one thing we're advising people to do and this is on the the environment and climate change uh canada website is to free clean clean feeders more frequently i know i used to feed birds and and not Clean, I'd clean my feeder in the in the spring, which was not a good habit. So, cleaning them weekly or biweekly, the more frequent, the better. Um, and, and again, don't be attracting waterfowl. Um, if if the neighbor, if you're concerned about your neighbor, you could always ask them to to not, given your concerns, and have a conversation uh, that way. The only thing I'll add to that is just um, if your neighbor is going to be feeding them, then just have them keep an eye on the birds that are visiting the feeder for any evidence of disease. Uh, we we're talking about AI in this call, but there are other diseases that wild birds will get, especially around bird feeders, some of which can be dangerous to people, such as salmonella. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. had, I want to say, about 30 or 40 cases of salmonella that people contract, contracted directly from songbirds, and that was through bird feeder cleaning. So when you are cleaning it, just take precautions yourself as well. Right, gloves, goggles, the whole deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions, but that was a really good around the world set of questions. So thank you everyone for participating tonight. And thanks as always to our esteemed speakers. Just great to hear all the different stuff that we have to cover in this very large topic. Uh, so we look forward to joining uh, again next Tuesday night. We have a whole different thing to talk about to be determined, but uh, we're going to get on it. So thanks again. And we'll see you